Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, coming along and giving us uh, some of your morning. Uh, my name is Reza Rockney. I am one of the solution architects here at Google, currently based out of our Singapore office. And part of the solution architect role is to try and find new and interesting use cases uh, to apply for our technologies. And one of the things I've been able to do is work with a few banks, including uh, Neil and Ruben, I'm going to introduce now. So, Neil, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Neil Boston. I'm a head of uh, IB Technology uh, for UBS, and I also run UK Technology, so I run wealth management and asset management out of the UK as well. And Ruben? Uh, I'm, my name is Ruben Lax. I'm a software engineer on Google Cloud Dataflow. And so the project that we've been doing is making use of Dataflow, which is our uh, batch and stream processing uh, system, to do grid computing. And we've done some uh, pretty interesting work. We're building out some demos and, and some near uh, realistic uh, scenarios. Um, but to just describe what grid is and, and some of the, the challenges and opportunities, I'm going to hand over to Neil. Thanks, Reza. So I'll just uh, talk through maybe three or four slides very briefly. So, and it's very from a, from a very personal perspective as well. So if you agree or disagree, please come and have a chat afterwards and we can, uh, we can debate some of the points. Uh, what is grid computing? I guess to me, uh, uh, not to read the, uh, read the words out exactly, but basically having a large cluster with a set of nodes that we're going to do some kind of analytic calculation with is generally the way that I approach it. Now that can be uh, deterministic stuff that I've coded in myself, it can be elements of ML as well, but basically I look at it as, as, as a large cluster of uh, calculation agents that are doing some set of tasks. Generally, hopefully you can make them relatively stateless and do it in a relatively independent way. So when you aggregate and bring the data back, that can be um, thought up and thought out um, in a relatively straightforward manner. Um, so as with most things in my life, I've started with three wishes. Uh, it's not asking for infinitely many wishes, it's not one of the wishes, or a large but finite amount of wishes is one of the wishes, I guess. Um, so I, when I approached and talked to Reza and we were discussing this, um, I guess in London, uh, it was actually in a pub when we first started talking about it. Uh, as all good engineering projects in London are. As all good, good engineering projects in London are, and they're a place called Farringdon, which was very good. Um, I started writing down what my user stories were, but they, they became three wishes, basically. So I wanted to write single-threaded, simple calculation classes, functors, or packages. Uh, I didn't have to worry about things like multi-threading, for example. Um, I wanted to stop thinking about creating my own directed acyclic graph, by temporal or not. Um, I just basically wanted to focus on my IP and my analytics in a very simple way. And I'd like to be able to tweak my experiments and run my experiments in a much more seamless way rather than having to recompile and rebuild a lot of my analytic classes. So I wanted some environment I could basically drop my functors inside, run a set of experiments, get a set of results out and do that repeatedly, either manually or through a set of machines potentially. So three, three simple wishes, I guess. Uh, challenges, um, I guess um, I've, been in, I've been in markets technology uh, for 150 years now, so a long time. Um, so quants, uh, I want them to really focus on my quantitative analysis, people writing maths. I just want them to get to focus on the maths and the outcomes rather than thinking about this whole fabric. So over the years that I've been in markets technology, you can spend 20% of your time thinking about the mathematics and 80% of your time thinking about how you make this thing scalable, how you make it distributed, how this thing can scale. And actually one of the challenges as well is you can spend a lot of your time, I guess my, my background is C++, is trying to optimize your C++ code to run on your PC, which is obviously uh, you know, diminishing returns of scale. So again, I wanted to try and get away from that. I wanted the people to focus on the kind of mathematicians and physicists and engineers to focus on running experiments rather than uh, thinking about the other aspects um, about the ecosystem and much more about the maths, the data coming back and the outcomes and analyzing that either manually or again through machines. Uh, and I wanted to be able to do it very, very fast. So if I didn't know which model to choose and I had a category of models to be able to get to some reasonable outcome in a relatively quick way by running experiments at high velocity was really the, the challenge. It's a kind of utopia, I guess, from a kind of quant perspective. Um, opportunities, um, running it on demand and also event-driven. They're two sides very much in markets technology. 
I want to. I sometimes run very, things at very large scale and lots of things, which you'll see later in the experiment. But I also have things coming in at high frequency that I want to deal with as well. Um, so you can think of it as a bifurcation a little bit, but you don't want a bifurcation in ecosystem or fabric. Um, I want to be able to run a universe of parallel ex experiments and then do some assessment either uh, of them, either through some parameterization, through some ML piece, or again, manually just looking at these things in a reasonable way. Uh, and then run huge, uh, I guess, simulations. So if you come from banking and have a look at the way the, 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 the market's gone, especially with regulation in recent years, uh, running large Monte Carlo simulations, for example, on port entire portfolios, across all the markets that the investment bank or the markets division has is again a, a significant challenge. Uh, and I'll talk about it a little bit later about the organizational issues that you have around some of the technology choices the banks make to try and accommodate some of those solutions. But again, regardless of the simulation experiment, and I wanted a, a relatively stable and consistent ETL style environment that I wasn't too worried about. Um, okay. And now I'll hand over to Reza and he can uh, talk through data flow. Sure, and um, uh, so this is interesting because data flow we use predominantly in things like ETL pipelines, so we're taking data, we're processing it, we are passing that on to things like BigQuery. So why are we using this for grid computing? Um, to look at this, and this was like after many conversations where we were sitting down and, and storyboarding this stuff and looking at architectures, you kind of have to deconstruct what a grid is, and then it makes perfect sense why data flow is a very good tool for solving this problem. So what is a grid? First of all, it's data. It's a bunch of math functions, so smart math folks like these guys. You need lots of CPUs, and you need some way of scheduling jobs on those CPUs, so you need to get data and functions to the CPUs and get them to do work, and you need storage. So let's go through those in a little bit more detail. And uh, we start getting into why data flow is particularly useful here. Um, so in terms of data, there's quite a few data sources. First, there's internal data sources, so the trades, et cetera, that are happening within the bank. There's a lot of information there. There's external data sources, potentially, from market environments, all of these raw um, underlying data that we need to then do some processing. And then there's sort of derived data. So this is data where you've taken underlying information, you've done some processing on it, and you've got some new data that you need to distribute. For example, the yield curves that you're creating uh, based off of uh, things like swaps and deposit information that you have early on. Now, the next piece around data is that it doesn't come in a nice static file. It's streamed, it's continuously being updated. Again, this is starting to get interesting in terms of what data flow is capable of, which is being able to do stream processing on that data sets that are coming in. Next, it's functions, it's mass functions, it's a lot of CPUs. Um, one of the interesting challenges, fun bits we had is, uh, a lot of the quant code that's been written in the last 20 years, I guess, is C++. And Dataflow today does not support C++ as a uh, uh, standard language. Um, and we had to do some work, and I worked with Ruben to get Dataflow to run C++ code for us. Uh, so that was a little bit of fun. So I, I, was, I was just going to say, I guess the 3.1 wishes, I didn't want to J and I into the C++, I wanted to think of it in a much more, I guess, natural way. So I guess that was my 3.1 wishes rather than just three wishes. <laughs> and uh, uh, I found out from Ruben that actually C++ is the uh, original flume, right? Yeah, so internally at Google, we do run version of Dataflow on C++. There was just, uh, at the time we came out with Dataflow, there wasn't as much of a cloud market interested in C++. Most people were interested in Java or Python or other languages. So uh, we basically made retrofitted C++ running on Dataflow, even though the original Flume Java was all C++. Um, the other piece around this is kind of that ETL work. So you're having to munge data, you have to shape it, enrich it, uh, and then once you've got that data, there's a place of storing it. You need to then store, pull from storage. Within the pipeline itself, you may potentially need to do output to storage as well. And these grids have huge fan out. So like, I can take a couple of megs worth of market information, or even, let's say, a gig, and it generates terabytes of output. So we need some way of actually being able to deal with huge fan out from these environments. And then there's one secret ingredient that actually means that when the testing we've done so far has been very, very productive. And that secret ingredient is the movement of data. So if you think about the fact that we've, we're pulling source information, we're doing ETL, 
Then we're sending that data to the next stage, which is doing the processing with that data, so running those math functions. And then we're sending that data again to the storage. These are all chunks of data movement. Now, with Dataflow, we can actually create a DAG, a distributed, um, uh, a directed it's like a graph, sorry, of computation. And those connections between all of the nodes, Dataflow takes care of moving the elements for me. So it start, So this is again why we start thinking actually Dataflow is a very good fit for this environment. And when we think about this, this, um, this movement of data, one thing I noticed, because I don't actually originally come from uh, a finance background, was you see a lot of organizational structure coming into how the DAG is created. So by that I mean there's a team that does some ETL work and they generate a file. This file is then moved to the team that does the grid work. And then the grid work outputs another file, which is moved to the team that does the analytics work. And what that is doing is essentially creating this organizational structure on top of how the technology should look. But that's not really what you want. What you want is one continuous operation from beginning to end. And uh, Neil will uh, explain this in better detail than I could. So, so I guess this uh, slide here, this schematic is not, it's not, uh, it's not specific to the banking industry. The, the way that I've perceived it uh, over many industries over the years is they tend to design technology by organizational construct. So what you tend to find is people within group A, B, and C will actually have a view about how their world looks, and maybe they have specific user stories that are giving them some, some niche aspect to the, the design patterns. But what they tend to do is build the ecosystem above and beyond their own boundary conditions and then hand over the data or the information to the next group. So then you end up in data kind of translation and ecosystem translation and then reconciliations and that style of problem. So again, um, and it hits, you know, like I said, it's not just our industry uh, specifically, there's other industries, but I think it can be the people then start thinking about technology choices rather, rather than actually thinking about what's optimal for their solution, front to back or from left to right, more about thinking about how their organizational construct is driving that. So again, one of the things I wanted to challenge a little bit was that we don't need to think about when we, take, when we think about it in an evolution or a revolutionary sense, I guess, is to think about how we can offer something out that actually crosses those boundaries naturally and has a very integrated um, stream-based and batch-based approach as well to the problem. So, um, a little bit more about Beam now, and uh, a better person than me to describe it is Ruben, one of the technical leads who built Beam and the uh, 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 data flow, the runner for Beam. Yeah, thank you, Reza and Neil. Oh, thank you for the clicker. Um, this, is, this, is, this use case is very interesting to me because as Reza mentioned, I think a lot of people see Dataflow as an ETL tool. It's a very common use case to use Dataflow to get your data into files or into BigQuery. But Dataflow is actually a, a programming model. And it's a programming model that fits this grid use case very well. It's a, you, you divide your logic into massively parallel computation with, the, with its stateless functions. And then, and then at key points, you also, set, you also put aggregations where you need to bring the data together to compute a count or to write it out to BigQuery. And the key to this is, as Reza said, this data movement, which is one of, one of these things that sounds easy. You just have to move data around, and it turns out that writing a system that can move massive amounts of data at scale efficiently with strong semantics, never you know, moving it, never over, you know, moving an element twice, never duplicating an element is surprisingly hard to do. And integrating that all together is one of the advantages you get out of data flow that makes it work really well for systems like this. So the way we have the data flow, data flow designed and presented is as a three layer system. So we have APIs. Currently, we have a Java API and a Python API, and we have more APIs coming. So there is a Go API, which is, usable, which is usable today in an early access. There's also a SQL API, so you'll be able to write data flow pipelines entirely in SQL. Then there's this programming model I talked about. All these APIs just live on top of this programming model. And then run, multiple runners to run your, to run your pipeline. So there's the Google hosted runner called Google Cloud Dataflow. This is this fully managed runner where you just point it at our cloud and it runs. But yeah, we also have open source runners. One, one on top of a system called Apache Flink, one on top of a system called Apache Spark. 
So your data flow pipelines are not, are not bound to only running on data flow. So this is interesting in the hybrid cloud case. We've also found in the financial services industry, uh, this has been interesting to some people for regulatory reasons. If a job needs to be rerun on-prem, if a regulator requests it, it can be done with one of these open source runners. So what is the advantage of the cloud data flow uh, system? So cloud data flow is one of the runners for this Beam API. So cloud data flow is, just presents this fully managed, you know, no op serverless solution. So you don't have to, the, the SDK gives you a nice simple API to, to develop these things, but then data flow manages security for you, it manages the cluster for you, you don't have to spin up a cluster to run, to, uh, to run your pipelines. It will auto scale your, your pipeline, so data flow will attempt to learn how big of a cluster you need to run your pipeline, and it will actually shrink and grow this cluster over time. You know, as you get towards the end of your job and there's less data left, Dataflow will just start shrinking the cluster and try to optimize cost as much as possible. Um, there's also um, a, a lot of integration with TensorFlow based uh, machine learning models. So there are TensorFlow APIs that you can integrate inside your Dataflow job, and there are uh, there's a suite of TensorFlow um, TensorFlow based transforms that you can run via Dataflow. So there's a suite called TFX, which is a suite of of machine learning uh, transforms for prepping and evaluating uh, machine learning models. So a classic example of that is, you know. I, I trained a new machine learning model, and I run a simple analysis on it and it says, okay, it's 5% better than my last model. Then you deploy it and you find out that, oh, it was 5% better on average, but it was, predict it was producing worse uh, results for everybody from the state of Florida, for instance. It is actually not a better model. So it turns out evaluating these models uh, um, is fairly tricky to make sure that the model actually is better. TFX provides suites of tools to do things. That's one example of the tools that TFX provide is good evaluation of models, and this all runs on top of uh, cloud data flow. So I mentioned that data flow lets you, lets you run serverless data analytics as opposed to other clusters where you have to run a cluster. So what is the benefit of serverless data analytics? Well, if you look, you know, this little chart on the left is traditionally what you would have to do to run your big data analytics. So there's a tiny little piece of your work in which you actually, you know, worked on your analysis and your insights, your business logic, you know, your functions, the actual quant stuff that Neil wants his people to spend most of their time working on. And then you would actually spend about 90% of your time on everything else building a monitoring solution to make sure your job is running. Performance tuning. You know, figuring out how many workers do I need to run this on? How much memory should I give each worker? So what particular type of worker should I do? Should I run on four core workers? Should I run on two core workers? Should I run on 16 core workers? Then making sure my utilization is up to snuff. Then, you know, figuring out a deployment story and a configuration story, and people would, sp people would often spend a huge amount of time figure uh, coming up with different deployment stories for, the, for these systems. Resource provisioning, handle, gl handling growing scale. So I came up with something that worked, and then suddenly six months later, my input data is 50% larger. The thing I came up with before no longer works. Going back, you know, resetting, going back to the start and running through this whole process again. Reliability, setting up alerting, making sure that you know, these jobs actually run reliably um, and, and complete as I expect. The advantage of serverless is to cut out all of this pie except for the analysis and insights. Focus on the actual business logic you want to run in your pipeline and let the serverless system, in this case Google Cloud Dataflow, handle all the rest for you. And finally, we've been saying that Dataflow is not just a, is not just a product, it's a, pl uh, it's a platform. And Google Cloud Platform is the platform that Dataflow is part of. So a platform is actually not just one technology. It's a group of technologies. 
that often uh, uh, act as a substrate to build higher level systems. So as Rez, Re, as Rez is going to show you here, um, an interesting thing here for, for this problem is not just data flow, but how can I use data flow in conjunction with BigQuery and in conjunction with Google Cloud Storage and use all these things together to provide, uh, to, to provide a solution. And da since Dataflow has sources and syncs, as we're going to show here, Dataflow has sources and syncs to all of these other GCP uh, stores and, and data sources, Dataflow provides a great substrate to link all of these things together. So with Dataflow, so you have sources and syncs, you have an API, which in this case is a Dataflow API, which is your way of linking everything together, saying read from, you know, read from, read from this data, run these transforms over it, write to BigQuery, write to Bigtable, write to Spanner, write to PubSub, write to whatever other sync you want to. Um, and your pipeline is declarative, and you, this, actually, uh, uh, this image here is actually an example of a data flow graph. In fact, I believe the one that Reza will show you in a second mm -hmm. yeah. um, of running data. And now Reza? Yeah, so, um, oh, uh, if I can have the ticket, oh, yeah, uh, sorry. thank you. Uh, so just a couple of things around the other bits of technology we use. I, when I was doing the experimentation with Neil, I don't actually have access to um, sort of UBS Bank's data, obviously. I, I have to work in my own environment. And we wanted to make this as real as possible. I didn't just want to make synthetic data, especially for the inputs and the ETL layers. Um, so what we were using was BigQuery. Now BigQuery is Google's data, uh, petabyte scale data warehouse in the cloud, fully managed and serverless. Um, one of the key aspects that I was making use of here is that it separates processing from storage, which means sharing of data is very, very easy. And this means I could get access to external data sources. In particular, um, Thomson Reuters were very kind enough to provide me data. So they have a uh, store um, in their project where they're putting the historic tick information and current tick information, including things like swaps, deposits, et cetera, which I need to use to build things like yield curves. Um, they also, uh, for POCs, they can put uh, up to 20 years of historical data onto uh, BigQuery. Um, and you know, I get the benefit of just instantly being able to use that stuff without having to move it around projects. So um, again, thank you, Tom Soros, for, for helping me do this. Um, if I can, uh, uh, one of the other pieces that we won't show in the demo right now, but we will be using in the real thing is, Today, I'm actually sending even the raw data to BigQuery, like very uh, granular data, just so I can show it to you guys. But in the real production system, we'd send outputs, the results, which is still many billions of rows of information to BigQuery. But the raw data that we want to keep um, is going to be many, many terabytes. That I would send to Bigtable. Bigtable is linearly scales, and we use it internally within Google for solving exactly that kind of problem. And it's perfect for this environment because we have many thousands of cores all running, generating data. And if we don't want to create a bottleneck, we can just use Bigtable and linearly scale it out and have all of those cores just push data directly into Bigtable um, uh, at many, many tens of thousands or hundred, actually hundreds of thousands of QPS. Um, so with that, uh, if Neil is going to walk through the uh, what the pipeline's actually doing in terms of the finance side. Yeah, so I guess uh, based on the <coughs> 3.1 wishes, I set up a, a kind of very basic experiment. I mean, I don't know how much background you have, I guess, in, uh, in investment banking and kind of markets piece, but basically uh, the most basic experiment I could think of was to source market environments or market data. So that can be things like FX spot or yield curves or volatilities. Um, take a portfolio, a set of trades, in this, in this case, we just randomly created a million option trades. Um, basically take that as our underlying data, process it, as you can see here, <laughs> apply some transforms to the market data, which is really, you can, you can, you can select a set of market data. You then have to apply, um, in this case, we use uh, an open source quant library uh, to produce a yield curve functor, I guess, at the end of the day, an object uh, from the input. Um, process the data, I also wanted to create scenarios. So what I mean by that is, in the market you tend to have a set of points coming in, you also want to be able to shift things around. So you can end up with a curve with 10 points on it, for example, and I want to shift each point independently, 
And I also want to do these parallel shifts as well. So you can see I wanted to try and create scenarios on the fly, which I thought would be good just uh, from an experimentation point of view. Then I wanted to uh, run a set of analytics on it, um, some of which I coded in, um, which is very basic, and then analyze the experiment. So this is kind of the most basic experiment I could think of. I could choose a different trade set to make it easier to price and easier to risk. Uh, but again, it was just uh, personal bias and preference that I, that I wanted to try options from a, from a personal perspective. So based on the 3.1 wishes, this is the most basic experiment that I thought we could start with just to see uh, what that looked like. Scenarios, again, I just chose very market standard things, non-parallel shifts, weighted shifts, independent shifts, and parallel shifts, again, to create a much larger set of output data sets, more in line with what I see in the market. Yeah. Thank you, can we switch over to the laptop, please? Um, so we have a, a good problem to have with a demo. Um, so we had timed this so that it is actually doing the uh, uh, scenario running while I switch over to the laptop. Um, last night I was working with one of our performance engineers from Dataflow and um, it's made it a little bit too fast. Uh, so um, what you won't see right now is this stage and I'll talk through what that's doing. You would have seen some numbers going across here, but it's, it's already zipped past it. I'll, I'll walk through uh, what I'm showing with now. Um, so. What I have here is the monitoring interface for Dataflow. So the uh, graph that I built in code, I've submitted a job. Uh, at the point I submit the job, there's no machines running, everything is cold. By submitting the job, Dataflow starts spinning up the number of workers that I've enabled, it starts sending my code to the environment, and it starts doing all of the, the sync and source information that we need. So in particular here, um, on the right hand side, we see information about the job itself, it's still running because it's now pushing the output to uh, BigQuery. We can see that it spun up 1,000 workers, um, and uh, in this instance, it's using 4,000 cores uh, from our environment. Dataflow does support auto-scaling, so we can actually let it uh, bring up the number of machines it needs and then bring them down. I deliberately don't use that because I just want to run, make this run as fast as possible, which introduces some potential inefficiencies, but. For this demo, we just like start with 4,000 and keep going with the full 4,000. Um, uh, a little bit more information here. So we have uh, able to, in my code, put custom counters that actually tells me what's going on within the environment. And this is tightly integrated to things like Stackdriver. So you can actually have uh, monitoring going on while, you're, while you're, your big jobs are running. You can see where things are getting to. In this particular instance, uh, we were sending a million trades and it was um, the number of scenario trade combination comes out to 847 million. So not quite the billion, but we, uh, uh, that's our next set of experiments. Um, a little bit more information. These are some of the options that I am sending in uh, to the job. So the, the, if we look at the DAG itself, so I am doing some reading of information. So there's some market data that I'm reading from Thomson Reuters information. Um, we have some swap data. If I expand this out, um, what you can do within the code, uh, each one of these boxes generally uh, corresponds to a uh, transform, and I can collapse logical things together within my code, and what that you see there is like, for example, read swap OIS, read swap USD OIS. These are all being put into a single transform. The way I've done this isn't how we do a production version of this. We just have a read swaps, and I just use code to do the different things you need to do for all the different data types. Uh, but I just use this for a uh, good illustration. So this is the, the read stage. If I highlight every single element uh, here, we can actually see the input and outputs of each one of these stages. Now I'm going to move down and, sorry, I'm not used to the mm, uh, touchpad on this device. One thing that we did as an experiment that's worked out quite well is um, rather than have the trades flow through the DAG, with introspection to the data sources for all the data that they need. We, I reverse this. So what we have is all of the trades come as a lump, as a side input. I do all the ETL and processing that I need to do, including scenario generation from the top. And then what I do is, because the introspection would have been lots of long RPC calls, and not long, but fast, but RPC calls, which are still expensive. What I do by bringing the trades and all the scenarios together, I just do a really dumb, massive fan out with a loop. So what it does, it just generates huge amounts of data uh, tuples. 
So the data that I need to run, which includes all of the values from the yield curves, for example, which is an array of uh, two and a half thousand, in this case, uh, doubles. I generate all these values and just let Dataflow do what it's good at, which is move lots of data around for me uh, and distribute that work. So here we have the trades that are being read coming in from the side um, and being added in as a side input. So if we were just to explain a little bit more on what side inputs are, um, so if you think of kind of like a broadcast join, if your data is, is of a certain size that will fit in uh, the environment, rather than do a shuffle join where we're joining all the elements together, you just take this, it's like having a smaller table, you take that smaller table and just make it available to all the environments. And then when my scenarios are coming in, because all that data is there, they're just looping through and any trades that happen to match the currency that I'm looking for come out as a, a fan out of the scenarios. So here, uh, we have um, the scenarios being generated. I actually do a little bit of optimization in that um, we, for each piece of work, we actually make it 100 uh, uh, scenarios that need to be processed because it's a bit more efficient in the next stage. Here we have um, the, this is Neil's code. So this is C++ code running in Dataflow. Neil has written a, I'll let him describe it because I have no idea. Um, well, I guess basically uh, I took the, I don't know how familiar you are with options pricing. There's nothing particularly smart about it. It's uh, Black and Scholes wrote a paper in 1973 on how to price options. They managed to show that it was like the diffusion equation, which is like a partial differential equation. So all I did is write a thing called finite difference for a way of discretizing and solving that. But ultimately, all I'm really doing in the C++ is doing matrix, sparse matrix solving calculations over time. So there's nothing particularly smart if you, um, if you look at the code. It's, it's probably the least smart piece of the whole kind of ecosystem, I guess. Well, that's what he thinks. I, I, have, I, I tried also, to read really, it, I didn't understand the word of it. 16 days as well to run out. <laughs> easily the biggest out of all that as well. Well, that's, that's where the real work happens here, right? This is, and this was a good, we use that function as, as something, as a good indicator of what a real thing would look like because it's doing real work. Um, and this is where most of the work is happening for this environment. So up until now, we've been doing ETL. We've been setting up all the scenarios. I've been doing these joins and distributing this massive fan out of work, um, which generates, as we can see from the output of this, 847,000 um, uh, results. Now, what we do next is we go to uh, push this information into BigQuery. And if you'll notice, the uh, number of uh, elements multiplies quite a bit. What we do is um, uh, the code that uh, Neil has written, he's got a spot index, which is actually the thing we really want, but he also has an array of information, which is the... Um, uh yeah, so basically when I, when I do the matrix calculation, which I iterate over time to some answer, you get basically a vector back based against different spot levels. Yeah. But I actually want the one in the middle because that's the current spot level. So that's the thing we wanted, and that's the thing we should send to BigQuery. However, we want to record, one of the advantages of being able to use this data platform is at each stage of the pipeline, I can output results and go back and look at them. Because I don't care about the I.O., right? It's just Bigtable will deal with it. Um, so what we do here is I'm actually use, taking all of those values as well and dumping them into BigQuery. Now, I did that so you guys can see it in BigQuery. In a real production system, the spot index is what we take to BigQuery because that's what you're going to do analysis on. The other values I'd write to Bigtable. So if you wanted to go back and check your results, you just go to Bigtable and Bigtable you can do really fast index and range scan lookups. So here I'm writing 14 billion pieces of information, uh, rows of information to uh, BigQuery at the end of this. So this is the pipeline uh, uh, running. It's now finished its work. I can know it's finished because we got Actually, a little tick here. Looks a bit, almost a bit closer to 15 billion to me, Reza. 14.9. Uh, okay, okay. He's, he's the engineer here, right? Um, uh, <laughs> the so, <laughs> and the mathematician. I'm outnumbered. Um, so I'm just going to show the results as they landed in BigQuery. So this a point is another point. The um, when this finished, there was no file that I then now need to load into my analysis system. When this finished, it's all done. I can immediately run a query with BigQuery against that data. So um, this is actually using a different uh, uh, table, but just to show the, the principle here, we have um, grid results. The details is 14 billion rows of information, which actually equates to 1.6 terabytes of data that's been loaded in this table. And what I'm going to do, not particularly smart, I'm just going to say, given the trade number was 8876, 
give me the max spot index across all the scenarios. So when I run this, it's actually going through and doing a query against all the 14 billion rows of information, and I have my output. So right at the end, you can actually start exploring your data set or generating the reports that ultimately we're not doing this all for fun, right? The bank is actually running this and want reports at the end of it. We can immediately start running the reports. Another thing that you um, can explore with, and I, we, we started to do, so um, this, with a, a Data Lab, which is a, um, a notebook uh, that we can do Python coding against uh, the data sources, because all, this, all the intermediate stages of the, the calculations are being stored in BigQuery, what I did is just did some exploration with a notebook, and I've stored it here as a PDF. Um, essentially, what we're doing is uh, looking at all of the information that's available uh, for the whole pipeline. So um, here, this is some underlying data that I had from uh, the uh, Thomson Reuters environment uh, data sets. I've graphed some of this information. This is what some of the underlying data is. Um, I actually had a look at sort of the yield curve creation to make sure that stuff's looking OK. And one of the things, so this is um, the asset and the numeracy of the, the things that I will send onto the C++ code. Um, uh, both are being graphed. One of the interesting things here is this is the numeracy. And if you notice, most of them are, are uh, uh, at the top. There's one weird one. And this was an accident by me. One of the scenarios, I typed 0 0.5 as the amount I wanted things to shift instead of 0 0.05, right? And by looking at this, I immediately know something's weird, right? Something's wrong. Um, and this is, again, something that the data scientists will then be able to use throughout the uh, output of the results. Now, I'm just going to go right to the bottom and let uh, Neil start explaining this piece. Um, essentially, this is like looking at the, the, the result sets. And Neil was interested in like trying to start looking at how we can uh, show this in, in three-dimensional space. And so, Neil? So I guess um, the thing that I was trying to get to was I'm a big believer in just like, looking at a set of results as well to see you know, just things that you can see visually. So when we went down the line of running the experiment, then I asked Reza if there was stuff we could put on top to actually start visualizing what this thing looks like versus various outputs. And um, when we looked at this, I was interested to see um, we were adding up the PVs, I guess the present value of a lot of these trades. So I didn't, I, I, it seemed like they were relatively canceling out. So actually when we looked at the portfolio, we realized we hadn't randomly created buys and sells. We'd done roughly half buys and half sells. So they were tending to kind of net out in some, in some option sense, which is kind of interesting in itself when we thought about the portfolio we'd created. So some of the talks I actually saw yesterday in some of the other, in some of the, with some other groups, um, there was some, I guess ultimately, uh, they really resonated with me. I was trying to get to almost like having a, a single inquiry box where I could type a set of asks of the data. Um, is this thing, is, is this a correlation against this? Does this look like this historically volatility wise? How does this look against like this over time? It seemed to me it was always, this was kind of evolving a visual representation of almost like a single kind of inquiry box. And I saw, I saw a couple of demos yesterday where they had that style of, um, that style of approach and a little bit of, I guess, kind of almost like NLP over the top as well. So you could, tape, you could type in quite market specific language and it would give you back a set of results around that. So I thought as an inquiry, marrying that to this, this style of experimentation output would be quite a strong thing. So this was really just a very basic, I tend to plot kind of like time against spot, against PV, against other things in a very basic way, just to start looking at what the nature of the portfolio is. But then given the couple of days I've been here, there seem to be some already some evolutions that I was kind of thinking of around how we could like start analyzing the data in a more effective way. And asking questions as well in a much more fluid experimental sense as well. Thanks, Neil. Can we go back to the slides, please? Go back to the slides, please. Thank you. Um, so just in terms of creating the, the, the pipeline, we, in that one we showed you know, the pre-processing stages, the running of the stages, the post-processing stages, and the, you know, the semi-joke here is like one pipeline to rule them all, right? We, we don't create separate processes for each one of these things. We just did one, and it went from the beginning, raw data, all the way to the output, including analysis. Um, and one of the other, so the other thing that we wanted to do is one of uh, Neil's first wishes is I want to experiment. 
So as we now have this uh, DAG to be able to do processing, the other thing we wanted to do is break apart some of the larger, so more monolithic uh, quant code and see if there are linear components in there that we could distribute again. And um, uh, Neil and, I'll let Neil and Ruben do some of this. Yeah, so again, uh, it was something that I guess I should have thought of over my career a little bit more intensively about. When we got into this sense that we had to stop worrying so much about the kind of like ETL piece that we were running it and the kind of simulation and, uh, and uh, ecosystem piece, we could then start really thinking about where there are parts, certainly within the, the, the kind of code base we were writing that we could actually uh, look at in a more linear way from a parallel processing perspective. And again, even when we were starting to look at that, the solution that we've just been talking about, that even had other implications that I hadn't expected where we started looking at the way that we could kind of like break these problems apart from what we've seen in the past, just as, just as a, someone writing some quantitative code. This is a common thing we've seen as people move from, you know, their old systems to new systems is people have code that was written assuming I'm running on one machine. And it would be highly optimized in ways that make it very difficult to parallelize. Like, oh, I'm sp I'll, sometimes, you know, I'll spin up threads and then join on these threads or interleave many different functions um, throughout my calculation. So it sometimes requires people to rethink how they wrote the code or maybe on a mathematical sense, look at your functions, say, can these functions be linearized as a, you know, as a, co a combination of multiple other functions so then we can parallelize all these things out and get a final result later. And um, uh, so what that means is that when you're drawing out the graphs, the more access me as a data engineer has to the various functions and being able to split them apart, the more I can try and think of ways of optimizing the flow and the parallelism within the system. So uh, the more I can, I can have like separate functions that I can pass data to and from, the easier this becomes for me. And this gets another, uh, an interesting point that we found very useful when we were doing this project together, and that's how we talk to each other. So, as you can tell, I have no idea half the time what Neil's talking about when he's doing the maths. Um, it's not my area, uh, and neither is uh, the, the finance area. However, when we break the problem down, for me, as data engineer, to bytes, so he can tell me, I need these bytes to move from here, and I need to run this function against these bytes. This output needs to move here. When you start breaking this down into a way that I understand, it becomes very easy for us to start communicating. And one of the things that we used as a common language is um, protobufs. So we started talking in terms so of protobufs. I'll, I'll let Ruben do what protobufs are. <laughs> yeah, a protocol buffer is uh, it's a, it's a common structured format for data that has been used at Google since probably around 2001, 2002, so it's been used at Google for quite a while. Um, it's very similar in, uh, to, to, to other forms of structured data. There, there are so some people use Avro, some people use Cryo, some people use Thrift. There are other forms of structured data. Protobufs are an optimized one that Google has traditionally used and is also open sourced. And that made it very easy for me to start working with Neil because I could just give him, he, a definition of how, how I'm going to pass things through, or he could give me the definition, and then I know what I need to do in terms of doing this process. And the other thing it opens up is this ability now to actually break apart the functions, because if all you're passing as the parameter to the function is a protobuf, and within your code you start just using protobufs to pass the information around, when you break apart the big uh, pieces of code, it becomes very easy to plug it into the DAG because all I'm doing is sending protobufs across those nodes and that data movement that we talked about. Um, so with that, next steps, you know, we, uh, as we said, running C++ on um, uh, Beam is not standard, so we got an example uh, that allows you to do some of that. I'll be updating that code a little bit more uh, after this. Um, you know, please have a go, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.